Thank you, Mike. I appreciate you. Mike's a great board chairman and a good man. And uh, we appreciate his leadership at the Public School Forum. As Mike said, I'm Keith Poston um, with the Public School Forum. Joining me on stage is Rachel Boyu, who, as Mike says, our Senior Policy Advisor for the Public School Forum. Allow me to also welcome you to the fourth annual Eggs and Issues Breakfast. What a, what a great crowd. I mean, this is another sellout event. Now, if you were here last year, our event was held just a few days after Donald Trump's inauguration. And it sure looked like we were in for an interesting 2017. Um, I'd say it was an interesting 2017. Now, we're just three weeks into 2018, and we've already had a government shutdown, and apparently teenagers are eating Tide Pods. <laughs> so, but on the upside, we're in the running for the new Amazon headquarters here in the Triangle, right? So that's the good thing. I think it's because of all the money I spend on Amazon Prime. That's probably it. He does spend a lot of money. Yeah, exactly. I think we all do, right? Right, all right. All right, for those of you who don't know the history of our top 10, about 20 years ago, we started releasing an annual forecast called 10 to Watch. Four years ago, we built on that idea to make it what you see in front of you in the book, which is a really a, a report around what we think of the top issues, we give some background on it, and then we give you really our perspectives and things we hope are guiding principles and goals that our leaders will take into, into mind as these issues come up. Some of them are the ones we know will be top issues, and some of them are ones we hope will be top issues. As you'll see from Rachel and from me, um, you'll hear about our guiding principles and we'll look forward to working with you. Now, if you're tweeting along, and we absolutely encourage you to do so, if it was on here, our hashtag is hashtag forum top 10, one zero forum top 10. And if you don't already follow us, we're at the NC Forum, so please tweet along. And with that, our top 10 issues for 2018. Issue number one, provide certainty for students, parents, and educators by fixing the class size crisis. Now, a little over a year ago, we were working on our top 10 for 2017, and as we were finalizing the publication, the General Assembly was heading into a special session. If you recall, this was back in December 2016. The House had already overwhelmingly supported um, a fix to give school districts the flexibility they needed. It looked like almost certainly that this would be fixed. I mean, we, we didn't want to go into 2017 and put it on our issues and then it'd be done in two weeks. Boy, we were wrong. Uh, the photo on the screen, if you, it's a little dark from up here, but it says, Earth without art is eh. Uh, that, that was one of the protests, one of the many protests that have been happening uh, this past year. I mean, some of them even spilled over to sit-ins in Senate offices. But here's where we are. As it stands today, our school systems do not have funding for the next school year. That's the one that starts in seven months. Well, and if you're actually in a, a year-round school, I'm looking at Bill Fletcher, six months. You've got schools are already planning for next school year now. There is no funding to meet the class size mandate cap and fund all of our special teachers, our enhancement teachers, our art, music, and PE teachers. There's no allocation for it. So make no mistake, without funding, those enhancement teacher jobs are at risk. Already this past year, art and music teachers have lost classrooms, had to put art on carts, sometimes store them in closet, and beyond that, we've seen fourth and fifth grade class size below. So, what do we think? Fully fund the lower class mandate and extend the timeline for implementation. Now, when we say fully fund, we mean all our art, music, and PE teachers. These are not nice to have positions, right? These are not nice to have positions. And if they do provide funding, extend the timeline for implementation. This is a crisis that does not need to be happening. Now, I think legis some legislators have acknowledged the obvious. Our schools do not have the funds, the classroom space, or the time right now to make this work. So we need to fund it, but we also need more time. And the second part is to trust, is to restore class size flexibility. Our school leaders do what is best for their students. They regularly make decisions based on the situation in each school. They know which, which schools need smaller classes, they 
They know which schools can get by with larger classes. They know which ones need turnaround principals. They know which ones are high flyers, and they need to like share that information out. Let our educators lead and make those decisions. Issue number two, adequately and equitably invest in our children's education, including their school buildings. So last week's Education Week report, if you hadn't seen it, released its ranking of North Carolina on school finance and other measures, we're 45th. Our ranking was especially hurt by the per pupil funding amount. Only 2.5% of North Carolina school districts spend at or above the national average. Now, Education Week based its conclusions off of 2015 federal data. So with millions of new dollars North Carolina has spent since then, we trust that that ranking will improve. Regardless, we got a D for school funding, 45th in the nation, says Education Week. The Forum's 2018 local school finance study has reaffirmed, yet again, the unfortunate and growing gap between the top 10 spending counties and the bottom 10 spending counties, a gap of $2,364 per student. This gap has widened in 18 of the last 20 years. Thankfully, the education finance reform task force members in the General Assembly with the distinguished co-chairman of Representative Craig Horn, who's with us today. They can work to abate this problem and they need our help. We know we can count on everyone in this room to help him with this job ahead. <coughs> and speaking of counting on everyone in this room, did you know that there is a pending and live bill? This is House Bill 866, Senate Bill 542, companion bills, the Public School Building Bond Act. That is an answer to public construction needs across the state. Not necessarily the answer, but definitely an answer. County commissioners, school superintendents, school boards across the state, business stakeholders all support this bill. And we need your help in encouraging our legislators to pass the bill and put this statewide school bond referendum on the ballot this year. We know North Carolinians will vote for it. Finally, a recent poll of southern states that will be coming in a future report to a theater near you asked mainstream voters across the South, do you support improving public schools by addressing differences in funding? Any guess as to what percent said yes? Anyone? I know the answer. Eighty-four percent. Very good to the folks at the front. Uh, Eighty-four percent said yes. I support my state improving public schools by addressing differences in funding. Issue number three: insist on transparency and accountability for school choice programs. Now look, I think it's fair to say that the divide between those who favor more funding for private school and school choice options, whether it's the private school voucher program, opportunity scholarships, or for-profit charter school management company initiatives, and the gap between those folks and those who don't support those probably grew wider in 2017. But I would say that uh, private school voucher opponents recognize those programs are not likely to go away even if they believe strongly, as, as frankly this illustration shows, that they take away much needed resources from our public schools that educate the vast majority of students. We believe that all of these school choice programs need oversight and accountability. Certainly, we saw clear evidence of that in 2017, when the state's largest recipient of taxpayer-funded vouchers, Trinity Christian in Fayetteville, had a teacher convict, convicted of embezzling nearly $400,000 in taxpayer funds and incredibly still teaches and coaches at the school while serving time in jail on the weekends. True story. Um, can you imagine the outcry if a public school tried something like that? Now, I'm, I'm, yeah, we're picking on Trinity Christian, but this is not, this is by and away the largest recipient of private school vouchers, 1.7 million counting. 
and it accounts for two thirds of their operating budget. So what do we recommend? Enact measures that require accountability and transparency for taxpayer dollars spent on private personal education savings accounts and school vouchers. The North Carolina House, to its credit, tried to pass laws last year requiring more accountability. Unfortunately, those efforts failed to advance. We need to try again now more than ever. We are on pace to spend a billion dollars of your money in, on opportunity scholarships over the next 10 years with very little oversight. And this fall, we'll have a new option called Personal Education Savings Account through which more taxpayers' dollars will flow to private schools without adequate oversight. We think we can do better. We also think we need to hold all of these schools to the same standards we hold our public schools. As we talked about on class size, legislators seem to be generally okay micromanaging school superintendents, but when it comes to school choice options like private school vouchers, we should at least expect the same transparency and standards that we hold our public schools. And our last point is around the virtual charter schools. We need to really understand that data before we move to lifting what's now a pilot. It's no surprise that the companies that run those two schools are working overtime to remove the pilot status. They were successful in advancing changes to the laws to, in our opinion, mask the high withdrawal rates. But the jury's definitely still out on private, on uh, virtual charter schools, and we need more time before informed decisions can be made. Number four, this will sound familiar. Recruit and retain the best and brightest teachers and principals. <laughs> Something that the forum has long had near and dear to its heart. We know that our teachers, our principals, and all educators are superheroes. For anyone who has taught a struggling reader or a child struggling to do math or writing, we know it takes superhuman powers to turn things around. And thank you to every superhero in the room. A special guest that you've met already, Lisa Godwin, our Teacher of the Year. We are looking forward to her sharing her superhero stories in just a few exciting minutes, the live taping of Education Matters. Uh, and on another positive note, welcome back new Teaching Fellows of North Carolina. A welcome kickstart by the General Assembly. Uh, indulge me for a moment. Show of hands, any teaching fellows in the room today? Hello. The loud crowd. All right. So we'll help this new breed of teaching fellows as it gets up off the ground. As a teaching fellow Old Guard alum, class of 93, Elon, I know how North Carolina recruits and retains the best and brightest into our teaching profession. And for all of you, including the forum members, who built this world-class program. We know, you know what it takes to recruit and retain the best and brightest in our profession. For one, bringing principal pay up from 50th in the nation was a solid start last year. A wise investment by our General Assembly. They recognized the problem and took steps to solve it. The new principal pay plan, based in part on school growth and school-wide student performance, has not been without its critics. The North Carolina Principals and Assistant Principals Association estimates that roughly one in six principals will lose money in the 18-19 school year if the hold harmless provision is not extended. Moreover, many veteran principals who have withstood the test of time in our schools, and no more than most, would like to see the pay for advanced degrees reinstated for the long haul, among other improvements. We continue to need increased investments in principal preparation. Principals are not created overnight. They require time, talent, and treasure. Finally, the one least talked about, the most significant change in state law, some would argue, was the elimination of retiree health benefits for future teachers, educators, and state employees effective 2021 and after. We know that a tangible benefit 
what a tangible benefit those retiree health benefits are for future employees, especially in this day and age, and for anyone who has been involved in recruiting public servants and hiring them, you know that it is oftentimes those benefits that gets a qualified candidate in the door in the first place. We need to have those future benefits for our future public servants reinstated, if you please. I like how you added please on that. Um, issue number five. You're lucky I didn't say it in French. <laughs> Once again, fix the faulty A to F school grade system. You know, I keep hoping one year I can take this one off our top ten list. <laughs> this law has been flawed from day one, and it hasn't changed, and neither has our opinion of it. A still stands for affluent, and this very simple chart, and you probably can't read it, but it's also in your booklet, tells the whole story. Schools that serve 50% or more students who are living in poverty only make up 10% of the A-rated schools. But they make up 92% of the D-rated schools and 98% of the F-rated schools. So once again, for those in the back, what precisely is the value of this system of grading schools? It doesn't trigger any additional supports or investments in those schools. I mean, unless you count the possibility of being taken over by the innovative school district. And we're concerned that this year, because of state law, the A to F school grade will, start, will now be issued these same letter grades, these same weights for student subgroups, like Asian students, black students, English language learners, special needs students. It needs to be changed. So, similar to previous years, recalibrate the formula. If we're going to keep the system in place, we need to recalibrate it to give greater weight to growth over time and less on standardized test performance. <laughs> Bare minimum, change it to 50% growth from the current 20%. Use the letter grades to identify schools for state support. We think the system's flawed, obviously, but if we have it, let's at least use it to drive additional supports and resources to the schools that need it most. And finally, consider other indicators of student and school success. North Carolina had an opportunity and still has an opportunity under the Every Student Succeeds Act to incorporate other school-wide indicators to measure success, things like chronic absenteeism and student surveys. Number, si number six, scaling up successes for our state's struggling schools. Say that 10 times fast. <laughs> Intermingled throughout our top 10 education issues is this undercurrent or overcurrent of North Carolina's increasing divide. Whether you call it the haves versus the have nots, the rural urban divide, whether you are in a commerce presentation, a higher ed talk, in a business audience, this same, the same holds true in public education. Are we really talking about achievement gaps or are we talking about poverty gaps? Well, here today, we are talking about both whatever kind of gap you call it. Struggling schools that have been struggling and chronically poor, chronically poor performing, they need extra support. And it is the role of the state to uniquely fill that role. Successes on this score have thankfully already been proven. And we are rightfully enchanted by returns on investment, whether it's the stock market, our 401ks, even struggling schools have returns on investment. For example, for those North Carolina schools ranked in the bottom 5%, studies conducted by a Vanderbilt University professor showed that for the four years of DPI's district and school transformation support, 70% of those schools met or exceeded growth. That is a Herculean effort, in case you didn't know. We call it the work of TALUS, or turning around low achieving schools within the Department of Public Instruction. Not only that, but in 2017, DPI demonstrated that TALUS's work resulted in 54 more high school graduates per year versus those incomparable schools for those schools that were served by TALUS. So, DPI found a $4.46 million return on investment. I'll take that ROI any day. <laughs> so you can see here that with bullet number two, a great return on investment would be to increase funds for the TALUS model at DPI. 
And two, we need to think outside the box when it comes to turning around our struggling schools. Because guess what? The box just ain't working. So let's think about solutions that work. Let's be creative. Let's be innovative. Perhaps allowing further charter-like flexibility to low-performing schools before they become chronically low-performing would be a good idea. What proactive measures can we take? We can create more incentives for our top-notch educators to go and work in struggling schools. This doubles back on our recommendations for principal pay and preparation, as a matter of fact. So, for example, if we're incentivizing new, highly qualified teacher graduates to go and work in low-performing schools, why not do the same for our principals and assistant principals? Issue number seven, adopt a whole child approach to help and learning. The good news is there is a growing recognition and acceptance of the notion that when it comes to education, we need to focus on the whole child. It's become a key focus for the state board, General Assembly, Department of Public Instruction. Part of whole child means looking at social and emotional learning and understanding that our students are coming to the classroom with tons of baggage. All of society's ills, literally on their back. This young lady's backpack reads neglect, poverty, homelessness, <coughs> immigration status, financial insecurity, hunger. So, ensure that all North Carolina children have access to high quality after school and increased investment in after school and out of school time programs now. These times outside of school are critical. Sometimes we refer to it as the second shift in education. It's also a time when we know that too many children are unsupervised from 3 to 6 p.m. From an academic perspective, the notion of a summer slide is well documented. And we know the important role that investing in after school can play in igniting passion and excitement in learning about new subjects without the pressure of grades and tests. We also need to invest in developing trauma-sensitive schools so that all children can learn and grow in safe and supportive environments. Now, the public school forum, we're very proud of this. We launched our North Carolina Resilience and Learning Project this past year to work directly with schools and school systems. We are working in two school systems today uh, to help all of the adults in the building, not just the teachers, the bus drivers, the cafeteria workers, everyone, to better understand the impact of adverse childhood experiences on children and how they affect their ability to learn and then to equip those schools with strategies to mitigate that impact. We're gonna to need to keep expanding that effort and ultimately it will be, the North Carolina will need to step up to really scale it up to reach all of our schools. Number eight, pursue outcomes focused strategies toward racial equity. With the increasingly diverse student population in North Carolina, and with increasing disparity data at nearly every turn, we know we need to work hard here. We know, for example, that historically, 80% of our teaching force in North Carolina is Caucasian, 80% are female. If we want our teaching force to reflect our student force, and studies show that this can be the game changer for a child graduating or not, we need to make grave improvements quickly. I hope that our panelists, and I trust that they will, and they all have very fascinating backgrounds in their own rights, will share some stories along these lines. I'll share a story. So, this is not Mr. Steele, but Mr. Steele looked like that about 30 years ago. Okay? <laughs> uh, he was one of those game changers I'm talking about. He was my mentor teacher when I was a student teacher back in the 90s, and I taught four plus years right down the hall from him in his classroom. He's a black male teacher, now retired, and Mr. Steele had every opportunity to go into administration, to go into the private sector. Some of you who are maybe from the Piedmont region will remember him and know the living legend that he is. He changed lives of children every single day, whether they were black, white, Latino, Asian, or otherwise. He could take a struggling student no matter their background, and instill the self-confidence in that child that the child needed to succeed. He could turn things around. He could help a child perhaps who had no father or father figure at home recognize that his education was the most important thing. 
we as a state can find and foster more Mr. Steeles. And we as a state have seen moving trends across public education, focusing on racial equity, and we know what we need to do. Finding more Mr. Steeles, diversifying our teacher workforce to reflect our student force, getting more students of color into our AP classes and keeping them there, seeing them to success. Improving our student discipline practices, keeping more students in school, getting them to graduation and beyond. Finally, let's get comfortable with the uncomfortable. Discussing race and getting to solutions is not easy. The forum will stand by you as we do this heavy lifting together, friends. Issue nine, keep building upon North Carolina's investments in early childhood education. Now you can clap, that's a good one, right? This is a, I think this is a real bright spot in education over the last few years. North Carolina has already had a well-deserved rec uh, reputation nationally for early childhood education. But the debate still existed just a couple of years ago, a few years ago, whether the benefits truly lasted. That debate is over. Um, we know it works. I want to give kudos to our friends at the North Carolina Early Childhood Foundation and the team working through the Pathways to Great Level Reading for helping to build that consensus. We also know it requires investment. As this cartoon points out, if you can read it, it says, don't talk to me about college loans. I'm still struggling to pay off my preschool loans. <laughs> Families know this, right? If you've got kids in preschool, this isn't a cheap, uh, private uh, preschool isn't cheap. The General Assembly has invested more, and the wait list for NC Pre-K is shrinking. But it's shrinking, that's good news, right? But a wait list still exists, and there are many, many more children who are not officially on a state wait list that would benefit. We even have districts today that can't take advantage of expansion funds because they lack classroom space for pre-K classrooms. That's also being exacerbated by issue number one, the class size mandate. So, some suggestions continue to advance and align birth to eight initiatives locally. I mentioned ESSA before. It has an opportunity for our state schools to better align birth to eight, and we encourage our districts to collaborate with early learning stakeholders in their community. I mentioned the positive investments, but overall, the early childhood education system is fairly fragile. We need to do more to recruit and retain high quality edu early education educators, just like we need more high quality K-12 educators. And then finally, continue to pursue positive collaborative efforts. I mentioned the North Carolina Pathways to Great Level Reading effort is precisely the kind of bipartisan cross-sector effort we need to foster and support. Number 10. For those who govern our state's public schools, do it well. And is it too much to ask to do it together? We've got the sandbox here because some of these playground rules apply. Who is king of the castle in public education these days? Do, do we know? Do we know if it's any one person? We do know, by design, our state constitutional forefathers wrote checks and balances into our state system. For anyone who has been in these constitutional battles in public education over the decades, and I know you're out there, you know the shifting sands of which I speak. Thankfully, there are those who know how to play nicely in the sandbox. And without belaboring too many playground rules here, let's get right down to it. By my humble count, and I'm sure there could be more, but my, by my count, there are seven different court cases, commissions, councils, or potential kings of the castle, if you will, that are hanging in the balance just this year. So, number one, the state board versus the state of North Carolina, the state superintendent, pending court case now before the state Supreme Court, as you well know. Number two, pending joint motion in Leandra, where some of the parties are seeking to have an independent consultant appointed. Number three, the Governor's Commission on Access to Sound Basic Education. Number four, the Joint Legislative Education Finance Reform Task Force. Number five, My Future NC Commission. Number six, B3 Interagency Council. More on that later. Thumbs up. Number seven, Professional Educator Preparation Standards Commission. And I'm sure I could go on. Those are just seven that pop into my head. Great job. Thank you. <laughs> now the pessimists in the room might look at these competing factions not playing out well. 
in the sandbox, as it were. Working together may be too much to ask in North Carolina's <laughs> current climate, but let me highlight some bright spots for you. In an ideal world, the state Supreme Court will decide in a landmark case, perhaps this year, the constitutional parameters of the balance of powers between the State Board of Education and the State Superintendent. The B3 Interagency Council, the birth through third grade Interagency Council, one of the creators who may or may not be sitting in this room, and I know many of us worked to have this council enacted, it was created by the General Assembly last year. It has both DPI members, HHS, Health and Human Services experts, and a whole broad swath of experts in this birth through third grade continuum of care, which we know puts a child on that trajectory of making it or breaking it in life. That is a bright spot. We expect great things from that council. And then think about the Opioid Prevention or STOP Act. This is one where the Attorney General, the Governor, legislative wars, there were no party lines on this. This was a bill that was enacted last year with funding to help abate the opioid uh, addictions across the state and the deaths. So these things can happen. We can work together. We have to. There's just too much at stake. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you. That is our top 10 education issues for 2018.